I'm Armina Nurbach, I'm a research scientist with Thomson Reuters. Um, I was actually one of the people involved um, in designing and implementing the um, Reuters Tracer project, which was briefly um, introduced during the, oops, sorry, during the keynote. Sorry, so, um, and Nick already listed most of the challenges that we face uh, working for Reuters journalists. Um, the biggest one obviously being that they're really stubborn and it's really hard to sell things to them, but that's their job. Um, so we're used to that. But other more important um, problems that we have from a technical perspective, you know, what is a news item? How do you define an event? How do you define what's a new event versus an update to a, a former event? What is newsworthy? What's not newsworthy? How do you verify your sources? How do you verify your stories or communities? Who's your audience? How do you present things to them and so on and so forth? And we already have some publications around that, which I'm, I'm happy to share with you. But this particular study was focused on a separate issue that we've been having since we launched uh, Tracer, which is the fact that Tracer was designed specifically for journalists who were monitoring Twitter to um, uh, detect breaking stories across the board. But after it was launched, it garnered some media attention. And now we had all these people interested from the other business units like legal, tax, you know, TRSS, special services and securities, and especially finance and risk within Thomson Reuters. And so a big client was uh, groups of people who do uh, risk portfolio management or supply chain uh, disruption monitoring. So they were interested in very high profile, potentially market moving um, uh, events that are unexpected. Um, they don't want to necessarily detect news the same way that um, Reuters journalists want to. They already have the Reuters feed. They don't want another news feed. What they want is things that Reuters is not great at capturing on a timely basis, they want to have a direct feed of that from Tracer, or from Twitter, sorry. Um, and those are events like uh, big natural uh, man-made disasters, um, accidents, completely unexpected events that have a potential to either disrupt the supply chain or move the markets. And so in order to design this tool, we our starting point was obviously Tracer. They want What they wanted was a certain group of um, accidents that were being uh, reported by Tracer ahead of Reuters. Um, and it fell into the category of disasters, unexpected disasters, and uh, disasters that could potentially move markets or be very high profile. So in order to define what those um, sort of kind of events would be, we went to the journalists and we asked them, if you were to manually set up a sort of feed or monitoring tool or anything, like a, a tweet deck or a hoot, hoot suite, um, to detect such stories, what would you do? And they would say, okay, we'd like the stories, uh, obviously our clients wanted the stories to be, to have some level of uh, sort of veracity and credibility attached to them because they wanted to you know, be able to rely on the stories as soon as, soon as they, uh, they saw them. Uh, so the, the journalist said we'd set up different lists of various people that we trust and they're subject matter experts, or they are accounts that monitor disasters um, on Twitter, say all of these earthquake monitors on Twitter, uh, set up by USGS or similar agencies around the world. We would set up uh, lists for those kinds of users, and then we would monitor those lists, you know, day and night. And so we, we said, uh, okay, let's sort of simulate that process, but automate it. So we collected a lot of uh, lists from our journalists and we started looking at uh, what kind of users were involved and we identified five main groups of users that would report on these high profile disasters. Um, there were local news agencies, you know, like a lo local ABC station or a local radio station somewhere, disaster monitors like the breaking 9-11 handle or all these uh, earthquake handles or severe weather monitors, uh, government agencies like the office of the mayor, district attorney, people who would uh, sort of report on crime, things like that. Um, police and fire departments, I'll actually show you an example later, and local journalists. These people are, were the main people who would be reliable sources of uh, reporting disasters and accidents around the world. So here are uh, four examples of uh, events that broke on a global scale. These became big events, uh, at least in the United States. And they were reported by Reuters, and they were initially reported or captured uh, by Reuters from uh, Twitter. And you see the original report that was posted to Twitter, and you see the first Reuters headline that was published. Um, and you see four different examples from four different categories that I just mentioned. So you see an example of a local journalist who captured the Times Square uh, accident, uh, a local authority that captured the OSU shooting, uh, a local news, uh, news outlet that captured the Austin campus shooting, and a fire department that captured the San Bernardino shooting. Uh, if you actually uh, look, these tweets were all ahead of the headlines. The headlines were actually detected by these tweets, via these tweets. 
Um, but the, if you actually look at the language of the tweets, you'll see that they're slightly different. So for instance, um, the headline just reports something happening in Times Square. It doesn't have any indication of how many people were potentially injured. Uh, there is a ve very vague reference of injury or casualties in the tweet, but it doesn't really say how many, it just says people down. Um, there's also different types of alerts that are very common. So different uh, alert, so, so sometimes there's colors ar arranged, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, associated with the alerts, like a red alert means a, a more dangerous or threatening situation than an orange alert and things like that, which the writer's headlines don't necessarily use. Um, there's definitely some language around sort of professionals being on the scene that can indicate that something serious is going on. So these are really uh, things that we don't really currently have modeled in Tracer. Um, and these are things that we would have to model because we originally wanted to base our classifier on Reuters headlines, but then we realized that these early indicators have a very different language. So we would have, have to model something after these very early tweets. So we uh, formulated the problem this way. We'd like to have a completely automated system that can detect these uh, breaking disasters from Twitter um, and identify disasters that were likely to break on a global scale in the future. So very early indicators of disasters. And uh, global scale for us, I mean, these, these were the requirements provided by the client. Um, these would be uh, disasters that are likely to break in either of these outlets. And future for us was the next, next 24 hours. And we contextualized these disasters along uh, five dimensions that we thought were likely to impact whether a disaster would get reported on a global scale or not. Uh, the topic would be relevant. The scale of the disaster, like if there's a, a fire, is it an apartment fire or a wildfire that spans m multiple acres? The impact, the number of casualties, people dead or injured, misplaced, physical or financial uh, impact. The location of the event and the rarity of the event with regards to that location. So we collected some data. Actually, we collected the data from Tracer. We didn't, our first goal was to collect all these lists that journalists had provided, but we actually realized that we can use Tracer to cr create a much bigger feed. Uh, and we've actually made this feed public. You can access it on, uh, on, on uh, I've posted it on Kaggle, so you can access the feed. But uh, we collected a large set of users that had cre generated um, crisis-related uh, or criminal law crime-related uh, clusters on Tracer, and we classified them based on whether they were topically focused, meaning, uh, you know, for instance, a, a, an earthquake monitor is very topically focused. It just reports on earthquakes and nothing more. Um, but we, we also had a sub second group of users that were locally focused. This, this would be like a fire department that's only reporting from a cer certain locality. I don't have time to get into details about how we classified them, but there's details uh, in the paper that you can look up. So here's a general description of the, data, the eventual data set. Uh, you can see a graph showing its um, geographic uh, coverage. I mean, you, as you expect, it's a little biased towards you know, English-speaking countries, countries where there's a crisis going on, like Syria or Iraq. But it generally, it does have a relatively good global coverage. These are the different kinds of news handles that were in the um, data set. And there's also information about how we classify these news handles uh, in the paper as well. But most importantly, um, when we did an analysis, we found out that these, uh, this collection together, these users would post almost, sorry, would post almost uh, 1, million use, 1 million tweets per day, which was obviously ridiculous volume for the, it's especially for the clients that we were working with. They actually wanted something close to like a dozen to a hundred tweets per day. That was the most they could tolerate. So we still needed to do a lot of classification. Uh, so we did some filtering on the tweets. Uh, we used a dictionary that would reduce, uh, we basically, that captured some of the terms relevant to these events. We filtered all the tweets that didn't have any words in that dictionary. Um, and we uh, split it into a, a sort of a development data set and a, a training and testing data set. So now, uh, after we had the data set, we started defining, identifying these uh, five different dimensions, topic, scope, scale, uh, location, and rarity that I talked about. For topic, we actually used a method that we've already published in another paper, paper which I've cited here. Uh, what we did was we extracted, Reuters has this uh, topic classification called TRBC. Uh, it's a schema that they use, five minutes, a schema that they use in news classification. Um, so they, each headline uh, in our internal system is tagged with a certain topic. We extracted headlines for each relevant topic, like fire, earthquake, flood, and so on. For each user, we also sampled 1,000 uh, tweets. And then we created a global dictionary. We calculated topic TF-IDF scores. It's basically TF-IDF, uh, normal TF-IDF, except you uh, treat each topic as a document. Um, and then we calculated the cosine distance of each uh, 
sort of tweet to the centroid of a given topic. And uh, we already reported that this method uh, works pretty well, especially in terms of precision, which is what we cared about. Um, it doesn't have great recall, but the precision is 90% if you set your uh, similarity as low as 0.5, which is not really that high. So we use the same event to tag the topics, the same method to tag the topics. For scope and scale, I'm not going to go into details. Um, there's more details in the paper. We, it was a mostly taxonomy-based approach. We used lots of different um, terms that are used in um, identifying scope and scale, for instance, the Richter scale for earthquakes, um, you know, the acreage of a wildfire, things like that. We also had a numeric classifier uh, that would extract cardinals or sort of implicit uh, expressions of, of uh, numbers. Uh, and then it would tell you if this number is, is the number of casualties, the number of people dead or injured or misplaced. Is this a financial um, sum that might uh, sort of uh, imply a financial impact, or is this a physical impact? We also detected all the physical assets like factories and businesses and things like that. And finally, we had rarity. Location we extracted using Open Calais, so that wasn't uh, a big problem. But for rarity, we modeled it very simply, very linearly. It was just interpolated between um, how common the, that event, a given event is to have happened at certain coordinates. Uh, and it, versus how uh, common it is to have happened in the same country. And then we weighted the country uh, part by the likelihood of the coordinates representing that country. So for some very small countries, most of the geopolitical uh, stuff happens in the capital or certain big cities. For countries that are engaged in war, um, like Syria, there are certain cities that are basically the, where the fighting is most intense. Uh, for countries that are very prone to natural disasters, they usually happen in certain areas. So this really helped. We also had originally a distance-based based, uh, weighing metric, but actually didn't turn out to be uh, much useful. So this was more effective. Um, for data annotation, once we collected our data set, uh, we actually used something, I guess you could call it distant labeling. Uh, we did the same cosine distance matching that I, I showed you before with writer's headlines. So we picked a 24-hour sliding window. Uh, and within each window, we would look at tweets that had a similarity of 0.5 or more to a given writer's headline. And then we would chain. But the chaining only went one step. So if there were other tweets that were also similar to that tweet, they would also be matched. If there was another tweet from the same user uh, that uh, was also similar, we set the threshold lower. Otherwise, we would just say this tweet doesn't match any headline, so it's an irrelevant tweet. And it gave us a pretty good uh, coverage. We had to rebalance the data a little bit because still most of the data was unmatched. So we undersampled the unmatched tweet, tweets. So here's the evaluation. We used the linear SVM, tenfold cross-validation, pretty standard. Um, you can see that as baseline, we only use a tweet vector, TFID vector, in the topic. Uh, then we added scope and impact, rarity and location versus all. You can actually see that scope and impact give, you, give us a bigger boost than rarity and location. So it kind of dispels some of the misconceptions that we had in our original hypotheses that there might be an inherent bat bias in the way things are being recorded, biased towards certain locations and things like that. Uh, this is a visualization of the feature weights for the SVM linear model. These are feature groups, not individual features. Um, there were some intuitive stuff. For instance, topic was the best a predictor of a match. Um, but war, while a multiple crash vehicle was a better, best predictor of an unmatched, because you don't really, I mean, car crashes, especially if they don't involve too many people, they don't really make it to global news. Uh, a surprise finding was that uh, human impact actually was the best predictor of a non-match. And I think this was because we cared about timeliness. So we only cared about things that are going to be reported in the future. But by the time casualties are confirmed, you don't care. I mean, the, the global media has already captured it. So your tweets are tardy already. And that's, uh, that's how you could uh, justify that. Um, I think the most... <laughs> Um, sort of disappointing result was that our formulation for rarity didn't really work. Neither the distance-based one um, nor the location, the country-based one. Rarity is just not a great predictor of whether something's going to be reported or not. And I think that's because one minute. Okay, that's because. Um, we're talking about AP and Reuters. These are global news agencies. They have to report on things. And actually, there was an earlier studies that showed that they are actually biased towards, sometimes towards things that are ongoing, so not rare, like the war in Syria. They would report everything that's happening in Syria, because that's of utmost importance to them, geopolitically, uh, geopolitically speaking. So we also did a um, timeliness study where we collected, uh, so Reuters has this tag called uh, 
uh, top line news or something like that, like major news, um, they tagged their headlines with that, um, with that label. We collected um, headlines that were tagged with that label for a period of two weeks. Uh, there were overall, um, I think, 18 headlines. I've identified, identified the ones in which we were ahead of Reuters by, the, by these two plus signs. We were ahead in eight out of 18, which is about 14, 44 minutes, 44% of the, of the headlines. And on average, I think we were ahead uh, by 24 minutes. Thank you very much. I would appreciate uh, feedback or questions. Thank you.